It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids podcast. Hi, I'm Kitty Feldy. Imagine a world so polluted that all the inhabitants of Earth must live underground for a long time. Instructions about what to do next are in a sealed box. And will we tell the mayor what's in the box? The assistant asked. No, just that it's information they won't need and must not see until the box opens of its own accord. What could go wrong? That's our celebrity reader, actress Melanie McQueen. This week, we discuss the dystopian novel City of Ember. Writer Jean Dupro says there were several inspirations for the book. One was the fact that I grew up when people were afraid that there was going to be a nuclear war. People were living in bomb shelters they built in their backyards. Um, There was a great deal of talk about that, and it made a huge impression on me. Is this the kind of book that keeps kids at Overland Elementary School up at night? Not really. I definitely think we could probably stop it if we all work together. This is the Book Club for Kids, the show where kids talk about books. We'll tell you how you can be on the show a little later on, but first, let's meet our readers. Hello, my name is Lucy. Hello, my name is Emmett. Hello, my name is Bailey. We're fifth graders from Overland Elementary School, Los Angeles, California. So the book is City of Ember, and what is it about? It's about a city that, well, it's like dying, and there's like not too many people, but everything around it's like black, and they're running out of supplies. Then these two people find the solution. Who are these two people? Um, Lena is really open, a pretty much like a social butterfly. She wants to be friends with anyone. And Dune is more of an introvert and doesn't like talking to many people. I don't think he has friends in the book. It never spe- specified until Lena came along again. Because in the past, Lena and Dune were friends. Lena is a very happy person. She really is very energetic and she likes to run around, which is why she was very glad that Dune wanted to trade Uh, her for messenger because she really that was the job she wanted the most and she was very surprised that Dune wanted the job in the pipe works but it does sort of make sense because he's always understood things he's always wanted to help people he's always wanted to have his big moment in front of the whole city and just say I saved the city so that's why he got the job in the pipe works to help fix the generator. Well, let's hear a sort of preamble to the book that explains the long-term plan for returning to the Earth's surface. Our celebrity reader is actress Melanie McQueen. When the city of Ember was just built and not yet inhabited, the chief builder and the assistant builder, both of them weary, sat down to speak of the future. They must not leave the city for at least 200 years, said the chief builder, or perhaps 220 Is that long enough? asked his assistant. It should be. We can't know for sure. And when the time comes, said the assistant, how will they know what to do? We'll provide them with instructions, of course, the chief builder replied. But who will keep the instructions? Who can we trust to keep them safe and secret all that time? The mayor of the city will keep the instructions, said the chief builder. We'll put them in a box with a timed lock set to open on the proper date. And will we tell the mayor what's in the box? The assistant asked. No, just that it's information they won't need and must not see until the box opens of its own accord. So the first mayor will pass the box to the next mayor and that one to the next and so on down through the years, all of them keeping it secret all that time? What else can we do? asked the chief builder. Nothing about this endeavor is certain. There may be no one left in the city by then or no safe place for them to come back to. So the first mayor of Ember was given the box, told to guard it carefully and solemnly sworn to secrecy. When she grew old and her time as mayor was up, she explained about the box to her successor, who also kept the secret carefully, as did the next mayor. Things went as planned for many years, but the seventh mayor of Ember was less honorable than the ones who'd come before him and more desperate. He was ill, 
He had the coughing sickness that was common in the city then, and he thought the box might hold a secret that would save his life. He took it from its hiding place in the basement of the gathering hall and brought it home with him, where he attacked it with a hammer. But his strength was failing by then. All he managed to do was dent the lid a little, and before he could return the box to its official hiding place or tell his successor about it, he died. The box ended up at the back of a closet, shoved behind some old bags and bundles. There it sat. Unnoticed, year after year, until its time arrived, and the lock quietly clicked open. How would we describe this book? Is this a, is there a genre? I mean, is this a realistic fiction? Is it historic? Is it fantasy? Is it science fiction? Is it mystery? Is it horror? What kind of a book is this? I definitely feel like it's realistic fiction because I could see this happening in real life. That's where we're probably going to go if we kept on this path. But it's also mystery. They're like trying to find all these clues. It's definitely a very interesting book. If you were to ask like a librarian what they call this, I think they'd call this dystopian, you know? Um, yeah. So in other words, the world really is gone to heck in a handbag. So if this is dystopian fiction, then how is it different than the world we live in now? You talked a little bit, Emmett, about what could be going down that path. I mean, to describe what's different and the same in that world. We definitely have more resources here because they're running out of supplies. And they don't have like all these different fruits that we may have now. So they're like, and they also don't have the same technology and the same knowledge that everyone has. Especially they don't have batteries, which if they had had batteries in this book, it would have saved them a lot of trouble and then they would have been able to use flashlights, which would have helped them go into the unknown regions and explore more and figure out what is wrong with their city. Kind of like what Lucy said, but also um, they don't have the technology to even make the basic of a flashlight without the batteries. You know, you talked about resources. One of the things I noticed was the only thing they eat are fruits and vegetables. Would you like to exist on a completely vegan diet like that? No. <laughs> I would not be able to do that because one of my favorite foods is like pulled pork. I like hot dogs. I like burgers. And I like bacon, so I would definitely need that. And I would not like just eating fruits and veggies all the time. Yeah, I definitely could not do it because I'm Chinese, so there's a lot of, like, chicken, sausage, like, meat and dishes, so I could not. The other thing in this book is school is kind of short for these guys. What do they get? How old are they when they get to get out? They they are 12 when they leave the school to get their jobs, which for us, we have, like, it goes up to college. And when you're in college, you're usually, like, either in your early 20s or you're, like, 19. But when they're 12, it's it's very young, in my opinion. Well, what about you guys? I mean, do you think 12 is, is a decent age to get out into the world and get a job and do things? I don't think so. It's a very short time. And plus, like, some of them are doing, like, hard work, like fixing a generator, fixing pipes. That's not really, like, work that, uh, like, a 12-year could handle. Maybe fine for, like, 20-year-olds. And plus, some colleges go all the way up to, like, 25, 26 for, like, law and medicine. It concerns me. <laughs> You wouldn't like to get kicked out at 12? No, not at all. You know, I first read this book back when we did Book Club for Kids on my radio show, a thousand years ago, it seems like. And when I first read the book back then, it seemed very much more fantasy-like. And when I read it again, it seemed like what you were saying, Emmett, that we could turn into a city of ember. Did it ring true to you that this was something that is in our future, your future? The more that people pollute the earth, the more likely it is for, like, we our water could get polluted and then we would have to live off of a limited supply of water or, like, a bunch of crops could get polluted and 
then we wouldn't be able to eat those crops. And it would just be very difficult if that were to happen, but it is very possible that it could with the way people are polluting Earth right now. Is this something you worry about? Definitely. A lot because I have asthma too. So one time in like second, I think like first or second grade, I had to go to the hospital because of a wildfire in Los Angeles. How about you, Emmett? Is this something you were concerned about? Is this a certainty or a possibility? It's definitely a possibility because we're definitely turning to cleaner sources of energy because we just discovered how to do nuclear fusion. So I definitely think it's slimmer than what it was if we just kept doing coal, coal, gas, like that. And I definitely think it wouldn't just be one city, it would be like thousands based on how many people we have in our society. Well, is this the kind of book that would give you nightmares then, thinking about that sort of thing? Not really. I definitely think we could probably stop it if we all work together. But if we just kept using gas, it'll probably turn out that way. It's only something I would worry about. I mean, I probably think about it when I'm going to sleep, when I'm trying to go to sleep, when I'm tired. I agree with what Bailey said. Like, I would not have nightmares about it, but I would, yeah, it would probably, if I were awake and my mind was racing, it would definitely be something I would think about, and it would make it much harder for me to sleep. And I would worry about it, but I try to not think about it. Seems like a good time to talk to our writer. You guys got some questions for Jean Dupro? Where'd you get the inspiration to make this book? Always the hardest question because I don't really know the answer to it. I think it came from many different sources. One was the fact that I grew up when people were afraid that there was going to be a nuclear war. People were living in bomb shelters they built in their backyards. Um, There was a great deal of talk about that, and it made a huge impression on me. So it's not that the city of Ember was meant to stand for a bomb shelter, but thinking those thoughts, I know, contributed to the story. But also, it comes from a lot of other other things uh, to do with my life, such as I just somehow I had the idea of a dark city where you don't know any any other place. You don't know that any place exists and there's no sun and there's no stars, but you don't miss them because you don't know about them. And I thought that was a fascinating premise for a story. So hard to say where exactly it came from, but it it intrigued me, that whole idea. How did you think of all the characters and how they would act together? In this book, the two main characters are sort of like me in some ways. So Lina um, likes to run. That's something that I used to like to do, not so much now. She is um, a curious person. She likes to draw, which I do. And Dune is also a curious person person, he likes to think about nature, um, what little of it there is in Ember. And he uh, finds the caterpillar and watches it turn into a moth. That's something that I have done several times. So, you know, I, I draw from myself for the characters. And for the other characters, I just make them up. I look around at people I take a little from here, a little from there, and I I make them up. How did you, like, figure out, okay, this should be this part, which would result in, like, this? How did you figure out, like, what event should happen to make the whole book come together? With great difficulty. The plot part is very hard for me. With Ember, I knew the beginning and I knew the ending. So that helped a lot, although I had to write the book many, many times to get the middle right. The middle is is always tricky. Sometimes when I write a book, I don't know the ending, and I have to work it out as I write. I have to see what the story is going to be and then see where it leads. And all of it involves a great deal of 
ripping out what I have written and throwing it away and writing something else. So it's a it's a painful process. I, I do not do an outline. I tried it once. It just doesn't work for me. I have to let the story grow out of itself. How did you come up with a series based on one book that seems like it would end by now? I do not know. I had no idea. I, I didn't intend for there to be any more books. I thought the ending of The City of Ember was perfect. It shows you where they have ended up. And it leaves, it leaves it to your imagination to know what's going to happen to them. So really, it was my editor who suggested that there might be another book. <laughs> and then I went on to write what was the third book, The Prophet of Yonwood, which had different characters. And he said, again, well, it might be good to write to bring it back to the original character. So it ended up with four books which was not my intention at all. All right, well, now we come to the hard part, which is where I ask you our hardest question, which is, what is your favorite book and why? Why do you love that book? My favorite book is Valkyrie because it's a really, it, it mixes serious, like actual serious consequences, but also funny. It's really funny, serious consequences. For me, my favorite book is probably When You Reach Me by Rebecca Steed, I think it is. It's one of my favorite books because of the mystery in it. So there's this boy, Marcus, and he's very mysterious, and at the end we find out that... Um, oh, don't give it away, don't give it away! <laughs> <laughs> but I should mention, that is one of our Book Club for Kids podcast episodes. So if you want to know more about it without finding out the ending, you can find it on our website, bookclubforkids.org. All right, Emmett, what's your favorite book? Uh, probably it's a series by Stuart Gibbs. It's called Spy School. Which just also happens to be another Book Club for Kids episode, but why do you like it? Definitely there's mystery and adventure, and everything's like new. Jean Dupro, what is your favorite book? Well, of course, that's impossible to answer. Here's what occurs to me. I was having a, a conversation with a friend about this yesterday. And a book that I always love, it was written during my childhood, I guess, or even before, and it's called The Borrowers. The idea of it is just completely engaging. The idea that there are tiny people living under the house who survive by borrowing things from us and whose great fear is being seen. Uh, I love that idea. Also, it's beautifully written. Also, the book that I have has the original pictures in it, the drawings. They're truly wonderful. Your turn, Melanie McQueen. What's your favorite book? My favorite book of all time is Winnie the Pooh by A.A. A. Milne. Even though it was read to me first as a child, I still love it as my favorite book. Partly because all the characters in it, even though they're flawed, are very kind ultimately to each other. And they live in the moment and pay attention to what's happening to them now and with each other. And they show that people can have flaws and still be great. Because let's face it, we all have flaws. We'll have a list of everybody's favorite book at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you have a favorite book, you can be on the Book Club for Kids podcast, too. Just have your parent, teacher, or librarian send us an email to kitty at bookclubforkids.org, and we will send out all the information. That's kitty, K-I-T-T-Y, at bookclubforkids.org. Thanks this week to producer Chad Francis. Brandon Baker composed our theme with additional music from Andrew Walton. Emma Steinkeller designed our logo. Thanks to our writer, Jean Dupro and our celebrity reader, actress, Melanie McQueen. And thanks to our readers this week, Lucy, Bailey, and Emmett. And thanks to Sky Sferdlin and Lorena Potier at Overland Elementary School in Los Angeles. 
We have a free newsletter for teachers, parents, and librarians full of free tips about how to turn kids into lifelong readers. It comes out every other week, and you can sign up at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And by the way, the makers of Book Club for Kids have created a very different sort of podcast. It's a mystery tale about the 10-year-old daughter of a congressman who solves mysteries on Capitol Hill. And she teaches civics along the way. It's called The Fina Mendoza Mysteries, and it's available now for free wherever you listen to podcasts. There are free teacher's guides and a facts behind the fiction blog. Just check it out, The Fina Mendoza Mysteries. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for listening.